Okay, now let's talk about some details. When you, when you come up with this solution, right, as being the least square solution, you make several assumptions in the derivation, okay? And these assumptions are here. You can read through them on your free time. I'm going to talk about, so just the gist of it is, things like, I know the values of x exactly. That's an assumption made in linear regression. So why I know has some noise associated with it, my experimental measurements, but I know x exactly. That's an assumption that's made. Another assumption that's made in ordinary least squares at least is that the variance of y, so the noise in y is independent of my de independent variable or x. That's another assumption that's made. And another assumption that's made is that the model actually holds, obviously. Another assumption that's made is that you're doing random sampling for y. Another assumption that, that is made, important one, is that the noise in y is Gaussian, which is, and it has zero mean and a constant variance sigma squared. These are all, a lot of assumptions that are made. Another assumption that the different measurements that are made, they have no covariance, which means that um, there's no correlation between two y values that you measure. The noise isn't correlated. Okay, the point is not to emphasize here these assumptions. I think it will just go back, read them, sort of think about them, then you'll understand these assumptions. The point is not for me to belabor them too much here. I want you to realize that there are many assumptions that are made in this process. I also want to think about whenever you're doing that Excel fitting and like getting a line or just doing any kind of linear regression, I want you to think about whether sort of these assumptions hold in the context of your problem. Many times, I don't, I'm guilty of this. A lot of us don't even think about whether the data that we have acquired, whether the no noise in that data is Gaussian. We just assume it, right? But actually, when we do that fitting of the line, we are assuming all these things very actively. So it's, that's why it's important to know that there are many assumptions that are made. And just to give you a general flavor, I'm not gonna belabor this too much again, just to give you a general flavor of where these assumptions come from, it is actually that when, you're, when you say that I'm gonna use the sum of squared differences to come up with this solution, you already have made a lot of these assumptions. Why is that? So say I measured something yi, right? This is just the equation for a Gaussian. So I'm saying that, that this yi came from a Gaussian distribution, right? And all I can look at my data is saying, give me the probability, right, of having measured everything that I've measured. That's, and so basically, what that means, this is a probability you know from the Gaussian distribution, right? And so I can just take the product of all these probabilities of having measured what I've measured, right? And then if I, try and maximize that probability, that is equivalent to me saying, that is equivalent to me saying that the data that I'm seeing, it's most likely that it has come from this model described by eta, right? This, again, to reiterate, is the probability of having measured by i given that the actual value of yi was eta i, which is described by the model that I have. And then if you take the product of all of this to account for all the data points that you have, and then you try and maximize that product, right? That's maximizing likelihood. That's what's called maximum likelihood. And what you can see here, what I want you to see here, is that when you take this product and you take the log of it, right, then this pops out. This term, sum of squared differences. And so what you do is you maximize the probability or you maximize the log of it, and that's where you get minimize the sum of squared differences because there's a negative sign. Okay? So when you do that, that's where all these assumptions are made. And then once you've said, okay, now I'm going to go in with this objective criterion, now I can calculate my formula for B. So that's where a lot of these assumptions come in. Does that make sense? So, again, um, okay. So, if, in case you were curious where sum of squared differences comes from. I want to talk about the fact that linear regression is very, very commonly used, and it's very useful. Like three characters, right? A backslash Y. It's very useful. So you have tons of examples in your reading. I hopefully you enjoyed those examples about the hemoglobin curve, about platelets, about a bunch of examples I saw. 
Also, I don't know, you took Marx's class last quarter, so just to reiterate again, flux balance analysis could be viewed as linear regression. So just keep that in mind. It's a linear problem, flux balance analysis. That's why everybody loves it, because it's linear, it's easy to solve. Um, of course, a very useful framework. Hard part of linear regression is being able to come up with this. For a given problem, right, you have, you have a problem that you're working with, to be able to put everything in this form is what is hard in linear regression, right? You know, it's easy when you have just one time variable and one experimental variable, but you can imagine there, when there are thousands of these experimental variables. You can do, there are a lot of cool tricks and techniques that you can do to actually put your data in the form of y is equal to ab, which will of course make your life faster. And in your reading, there's this talk of linearization, right? Right, which is about, so for example, if you're working with an exponential curve, Right? So I have an exponential curve of the form A0 times exponential to the power minus A1t, where A0 and A1 are unknown parameters, right? A0 times e to the power minus A1t. I have that. If I take the log of it, then that becomes natural log of A0 minus A1 times t, right? And now you have linearity. Because ln a0 can be thought of as one parameter and a1 can be thought of as the other parameter. Your, your equation is linear in parameters. And I'm going to just show that, in case that's not clear, going back to the radio wave data that we got from Data Thief, right? So here's a script I wrote. It's uploaded on SpinetX. So basically, here's the math for it. The model say, in that case, the model, the data that I got, Say this data, I want to model it as an exponential. It seems reasonable. It looks like ex exponential data to me, right? So the model for this might be something like y naught times x minus kt, right? Which can be linearized to ln y is ln y naught minus kt, right? This makes sense to everybody, right? And now you realize that this is just beta naught plus beta 1x, right? That's what it is. It's mx plus y, uh, mx plus c. y is equal to mx plus c. It's linear. I'm linear now. Earlier I wasn't linear in this parameter k because I had exponential. Now I'm linear in the parameter k, right? So all I have to do, do is take a logarith, um, is to take the natural log of all my experimental measurements, and then I'm set, right? So, so you can get ax is equal to b or y is equal to ab in my other notation where b is ln y, you take the natural log of your experimental measurements, a is ones minus t. So how does this make sense? If you do matrix multiplication here, X looks like ln y naught and k. So you have ln y naught multiplied by 1 minus kt, and you do that for every data point. And then you recover all your y values. Does, that, does this make sense? Should I spend more time on this? Is this confusing for people? Yeah. Should I write on the whiteboard? Maybe that's helpful here. Okay. Say you have your A matrix here. You have just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And this is my ln y. And this is a vector, by the way, right? And then this is, say, minus, so minus t1, minus t2, minus t3, one. And then my parameters are ln y of 0 and k. Do the matrix multiplication there, right? Then y0 minus kt1 is ln y1. ln y2 is ln y0. Again, it's about recognizing how your problem becomes y is equal to a x. And then, so that makes sense? So just to go back from the beginning of the script, what I'm doing, I'm just loading the data. I rescale the x-axis because if, you know, the time there starts at 500 milliseconds or something, I want to, of course, start at zero milliseconds, right? That's when this equation holds. So I rescale everything. I can plot it. And then finally, I do this. I, I just, this is my A matrix. This is my B matrix. Just taking logs here. In a parameter estimation, right? And then I'm going to display my results. Your reading goes through polyfit. I'm not going to talk about it right now, but that's another way to do this. Done. Data fit. Good, right? And these are parameter values that came out. Or for two. Okay? Question. Both, right? It has to be, right? And so also 
like, right, so sometimes in papers you have really thick traces. If you have really thick traces, yeah. then of course it's gonna, right. And so, I mean, I'm not, data thief is not work that you do and then go publish. Data thief is work that you do to like try and find loopholes and things that are out there or try and really understand what's out there, right? Just try and make mathematical sense of what's going on. Um, okay, so you get a bit that. We saw an example of linear regression, right? And now we can study, right, what is the implication of this? We can actually study how these nanoparticles might be working in an in vivo system, right? Going back to where the paper was, what the paper was talking about, we can start talking about how quickly they cool because that's what this decay constant means here, right? We have a number for that. That's cool. Right. Um, get the time constant value, basically. Okay. So linear regression, super important, super important.